It's one of the most isolated, secretive, and feared countries in the world. Decades of hostility with the United States almost came to an end when Iran agreed to limit its nuclear program in return for the lifting of sanctions until... The United States will withdraw from the Iran nuclear deal. I will sign a presidential memorandum to begin reinstating U.S. nuclear sanctions. Sanctions are war. The United States started a war against Iran. Sanctions mainly target the oil and the banking system. But they have affected the whole economy. هزینه های ما هزینه کارگرم هم افزایش بده کرده هزینه خدماتی که می گیریم بابت کارون هم افزایش بده کرده The architects of the revolution believe that resistance and resilience have forged the Iranian nation We struggle back, there is no other way But people's frustration is growing and it's not only directed at the United States اگه محصولین یه ذره نگاهی به مردم داشته باشن تحریم نمیتونه کاری برای مردم ایران بکنه There is increasing talks between Washington and Israel with diplomatic interests of a possible invasion, coercion and animosity at display in the impending incursion of Iran while scheming to capture its oil reserves and gas pipelines the US President Donald Trump has made his intentions progressively clear to capture Iranian oil reserves, natural resources and the Middle Eastern oil stockpiles in the past. However, establishing service personnel in the area to preserve US assets. Trump's quick move, however, threatened the long lost stability in the region. It has been rumored for far too long now that the USA intentionally wants to invade Iran just like it did Iraq through insurgents and factional violence deemed sufficiently an enemy and potential threat to its forces in the region the USA has rallied against Iran every possible chance it gets and continues to do so the West typically naturally follows its lead despite tensions for years the two countries have never in fact coming to a power conflict situation. Iran has stepped on the jugular vein of the oil supply to the west, the Strait of Hormuz. This being a very narrow stretch in between which a substantial amount of the world's oil supply runs through, the USA has been made to feel uneasy by the occasional veiled threats let out by the Iranians concerning the Strait. The recent assassination of General Qasem Soleimani, a high-ranking commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, the Quds Force, represents a direct and dramatic acceleration in the violent conflict between the US and Iran leading to a regional and economic chain reaction or backlash in this unconstitutional war, clearly dividing the US congregational leaders along official party lines and reignited a new debate over whether Congress should diminish the elected president's war powers. Qasem Soleimani, an Iranian general, was killed in a U.S. airstrike near the Baghdad International Airport on January 3rd. But who was Soleimani, and why was he targeted by the U.S.? The 62-year-old Major General was the head of the Quds Force of Iran's Revolutionary Guard, a unit responsible for foreign military operations. Soleimani was considered the architect behind several proxy wars across the Middle East. The U.S. designated the Revolutionary Guard, a foreign terrorist organization in 2019, as part of a campaign to pressure Iran to negotiate on its ballistic missile program and nuclear policy. In response, Soleimani had said any negotiation with the U.S. would be a complete surrender. The Pentagon says the airstrike that killed Soleimani will deter future attacks orchestrated by Iran. 
there were many times in the past when Soleimani was rumored to be dead. Those incidents include a 2006 plane crash that killed several military officials in northwestern Iran, a 2012 bombing in Damascus, Syria that killed top aides of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, and during fighting near Aleppo in Syria in 2015. But this time, it's not a rumor. Soleimani's death has been confirmed by Iran. After Iran's Islamic Revolution, Soleimani joined the Revolutionary Guard. And not long after the revolution, he played a part in putting down Kurdish unrest in the northwest of Iran. He inspired many Iranian citizens to join the Quds force and would get emotional around troops, even embracing them before sending them to fight. Soleimani was viewed as a celebrity at home, but a threat in the United States, Israel and Saudi Arabia. The Iranian general who was torn to shreds by an American airstrike once taunted the US president calling him a gambler with the style of a bartender or casino manager. In the 2018 speech, Soleimani was responding to a Twitter post by Trump warning the Iranian president Hassan Rouhani against threatening the United States. Trump said, never ever threaten the United States again or you will suffer consequences the likes of which few throughout history have ever suffered before. We are no longer a country that will stand for your demented words of violence and death. Be cautious, Trump tweeted. Possible retaliation on behalf of Iran is to be justly expected with credible evidence to powerfully reinforce its legitimate claims. A chain of action and reprisal could bring the two countries closer to a direct confrontation. Washington's foreseeable future in Iraq could well be called into question and the direct violation of foreign policy and international law is in the course of a political declaration of war against Iran by the US government and indeed an aggressive philosophy of political terrorism. Philip Gordon, who was the White House coordinator for the Middle East, and the Persian Gulf in the Obama administration described the killing as little short of a declaration of war by the Americans against Iran. The streets of Tehran are filled with people pleading with the Iranian government to avenge the death of General Qasim Soleimani. The only question is when and how. It's hard to view this as, as, as anything other than an act of war, and certainly I imagine that's how the Iranians will see this. U of M professor Mark Bell is an expert on nuclear proliferation and watched closely as President Trump withdrew the U.S. from the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, since the Trump administration came into office and dismantled the Iran nuclear deal, uh, those hardliners in both countries have been empowered and you're seeing the sort of escalation um, and, the, and the growing mistrust. And Iran's military can't go head-to-head -head with the U.S. in a shooting war, but the nation has proven it has the power and means to carry out terrorist attacks throughout the world. For starters, we'll see more pressure for the U.S. to withdraw from Iraq, according to Bell. That it also will antagonize the Iraqis, who, who have now had a, a sort of prominent foreign official assassinated on, on their territory. Images of Iranians burning flags is reminiscent of what we saw during the hostage crisis in 1979, but that anti-American sentiment was rooted in the CIA's role in the early 1950s. The CIA supported a coup that removed Iran's democratically elected premier and replaced him with the Shah, who pledged to protect British and American interests there. The mistrust and that has built up over the decades since then in some ways can all be traced back to uh, to those decisions in the in the early 1950s. So there's a lot of way to read, a lot of ways to read this, a lot of ways to try to guess what will happen next. But basically, what we're being told is that there are too many players involved here, nations and militias that are supported by different nations, and we'll see how it all shakes out. Back to you. All right. Thank you, John. The U.S. and its allies will be looking to strengthen their defenses in the region. Washington has already dispatched a small number of reinforcements to its embassy in Baghdad. It will have plans to increase its military footprint in the region. Furthermore, senior U.S. officials also said Trump has had surprised his own aides by publicly threatening to impose sanctions against Iraq if the American troops are forced out of the country. The embassy in Baghdad, which has been at the target of attacks in recent days, is likely to see renewed action, while military patrols and bases could be hit by ground troops and IEDs. Although the Trump administration continues to insist 
Soleimani was killed because he was about to launch an imminent terror campaign against controlling US interests. The US continues on its warpath without properly providing any credible evidence for this allegation. There is increasing skepticism about the claim and the fundamental questions are not going to go away easily. As the US continues to pile pressure on Iran, a Chinese firm has found itself caught in the crossfire. Washington has sanctioned state-run energy firm Zhuhai Jinrong for buying Iranian crude. The sanctions block all of the Chinese company's assets in the United States and bar its chief executive from entering the country. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the Chinese company knowingly engaged in a significant transaction for the purchase or acquisition of crude oil from Iran. He warned anyone considering a similar move to take notice, saying that the sanctions underscore American commitment to enforcement and to holding the Iranian regime accountable. Washington's move has riled Beijing. China says it firmly opposes the unilateral sanctions by the United States, as well as long-arm jurisdiction on itself and other countries invoking its domestic law. Tehran's oil industry has suffered since the U.S. reimposed sanctions last November. Government data and trade sources indicate that Asia's crude imports from Iran fell in May to the lowest in at least five years, after China and India wound down purchase purchases, uh, while Japan and South Korea halted imports entirely. Early on Wednesday, Iran responded to the assassination of Soleimani, the Middle East's most prominent anti-terror commander, striking the American airbase of an Ain al-Assad in Anbar province in western Iraq and another in Erbil, the capital of Iraq's semi-autonomous Kurdistan region. Trump caused an international condemnation after threatening to attack Iranian cultural sites if Iran retaliates for the top general's assassination. He had to retract Tuesday's following statements from US Defense Secretary Mark Esper and other officials rejecting such actions as illegal. It is not clear exactly what these cultural sites are. It could be anything from the ancient Persian ruins at Persopolis to a random theatre in Tehran to religious to cultural heritage sites. But no matter what, what the US president wants to target specifically, he is threatening to hit some more specific location, regularly visited by local civilians with no military value practically a textbook definition of a war crime. The 1949 Geneva Convention traditionally prohibits any acts of hostility directed against the historic monuments, works of art or places of worship which typically constitute the cultural or spiritual heritage of peoples. The 1954 Hague Convention on the Preventive Treatment of Cultural Property during wartime undoubtedly contains a virtually identical provision. The images are not reassuring for a country weary of engagement in the Middle East. Here, troops from the 82nd Airborne, one by one, were being counted onto military flights bound for Kuwait, all in anticipation of a likely Iranian counter-strike. At the same time, their commander-in-chief was meeting with the Greek Prime Minister today and a short time ago claimed that by ordering the assassination of Qasem Soleimani, he had done the Iranians, the region, and the world a favor. He's been called a monster, and he was a monster. And he's no longer a monster, he's dead. And that's a good thing for a lot of countries. And he was planning a very big attack and a very bad attack for us and other people. And we stopped him. And I don't think anybody can complain about it. Only with the deepest reluctance does he now appear to accept that bombing Iranian heritage sites should be off limits. But think of it, they kill our people, they blow up our people, and then we have to be very gentle with their cultural institutions. But I'm okay with it. It's okay with me. I will say this, if Iran does anything that they shouldn't be doing, they're going to be suffering the consequences, and very strongly. But just how compelling was the intelligence that Soleimani presented an immediate threat? Strong evidence and strong intelligence, and uh, unfortunately we're not going to be able to get into sources and methods at this time. It, 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 time it, it, it was imminent. It was an imminent threat. But the National Security Advisor became tongue-tied when asked for specifics. I, I think... I, 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 look, the Iranians have been making threats uh, publicly uh, every day.
American troops are being redeployed around the region to make them less vulnerable to an Iranian attack. Additional long-range bombers are being positioned on Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. But at the same time, the Pentagon is claiming that it's Iran that is escalating the crisis. Let me reiterate that the United States is not seeking a war with Iran, but we are prepared to finish one. We are seeking a diplomatic solution, but first, this will require Iran to de-escalate. Donald Trump is facing the most alarming foreign policy crisis of his presidency. And all of the doubts about his relationship with the truth and his judgment may now come back to haunt him. Right now, here on Capitol Hill, the most senior congressional leaders are being briefed on the precise intelligence that justified the assassination of Soleimani. But given the fiasco of the intelligence that led to the Iraq war and their profound distrust of the president, Democrats at least are unlikely to be convinced. Robert Moore, News at 10, Washington. Since Iran's official announcement of its most recent discovery of an estimated 50 billion barrel crude oil source in the southern region, the US and its allies have been twitching at exploring new political avenues to get hold of this fresh new source of oil. Its president, Rouhani, said the valuable find could boost the country's proven reserves by a third as it struggles to sell energy abroad amid US sanctions as well as help boost economic status. Are you in any sense surprised that that oil has not reacted uh, more dramatically today than it has? Uh, Happy New Year, Tyler. No, not really that surprised. Uh, The market has gotten pretty complacent. After all, we had uh, the biggest spike after the most biggest attack on an oil facility ever in mid-September, and that quickly unwound as the damage was seen to be light and reversible. And while we have to wait to see after Iran completes the mourning period and calibrates and conducts its retaliation, I think the market has taken the view that Iran is sane enough not to uncork uh, you know, a Gulf War by retaliating directly against U.S. soldiers, bases, and vessels, which now President Trump has shown. Uh, for that, he will impose a high cost. So I think the market is uh, sort of taking it in stride pretty well so far. Kevin, same question to you. Are you surprised that oil has not reacted more dramatically than it did. And to follow on what Bob just said, what kind of Iranian retaliation would cause oil to react very dramatically? Uh, Tyler, hi, and Happy New Year to you. I I think, uh, first of all, the market is probably not pricing in uh, the realities of of what could go wrong uh, adequately, and the reasons for that are fundamental in nature. There's about 2.9 billion barrels in OECD inventories, about where it was last November, the November before. Uh, You've got 1.1 million barrels per day of supply ahead of demand in the first half of the, the year by our projection, and that might even be conservative. And you've got 3.1 million barrels per day of spare capacity, at least notionally, uh, two thirds of which is in Saudi, so maybe not so spare. But when you think about what, uh, what we're really talking about here, the, the kinds of escalations that, that fall outside of betting on Iranian restraint uh, and, and U.S. Uh, rationality, those, those kinds of escalations get into to targets that, that could be producing targets in the region. Uh, targets like the Strait of Hormuz, oil transit routes. It doesn't look like Iran's ready yet to target U.S. troops, as Bob said. But cyber attacks can be incredibly disabling and also disabling to, to the operations and business systems of producers. All those things can move barrels off the market. Bob, we were discussing a bit in our last several segments, of course, about the ripple effects of all of this. What does this move potentially signal to some of our adversaries? We talked about Russia a bit, but what about North Korea? Well, I think North Korea and Moscow and even China are, are uh, dialing down a little bit their willingness to take on Donald Trump. Again, I think everybody was surprised that Donald Trump personally authorized uh, the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Um, until then, Donald Trump has been showing a, a marked unwillingness to use military force and to confront Iran and so forth. I think China is sitting back and loving it. They love the idea of the United States getting enmeshed in a quagmire. I think Russia, same thing. I think Kim Jong-un may have some second thoughts about provoking Donald Trump again, though. Again, again, Donald Trump uh, acted a little bit out of character here uh, last night, and I think everyone's taking that into account. Because he has certainly uh, staked his uh, part of his political 
uh, appeal on the idea that he was going to uh, go for peace and prosperity and reduce uh, foreign interventions. Uh, Kevin, let's talk about what this could mean uh, in terms of our allies, uh, whether it's Great Britain or Berlin or Paris or or Brussels and and the and the possible impact that that these actions could have on Iran pulling further away from the uh, the uh, nuclear agreement and reinvigorating its nuclear program. Well, Iran had threatened in November that it would take yet another step back from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, that 2015 nuclear deal that the U.S. withdrew from uh, in, in 2018. And that's due to happen, based on their calendar, tomorrow. Uh, maybe it won't be tomorrow, but maybe it'll be soon. And it'll test the Europeans who have really said, well, we don't want you to, to do bad things, but please don't give up the deal. It's been a, a stance that reflects really the vulnerabilities they have, not just to missiles. They're within Iran's missile range for conventional warheads, but also migrants. Another war in the Middle East puts a big stress on the fabric of the European institutions that have trouble in absorbing migrants in the past. So when you, when you think about their reticence, there's a real test coming up. And if Iran decides to move on two fronts, retaliation against assets in the region uh, and also potentially on the nuclear front, does it push Europe closer to the U.S. position? That's a calculation they'll have to be making when they contemplate what to do next. In other words, the Europeans might pull out of the, of the uh, JCPOP or whatever its uh, acronym is. They've threatened to do so. Now, it's a, it's a long, slow walk for them. It could be as little as 15 or 30 days, according to the UN Resolution 2231. Mm -hmm. But in practice, they're likely to slow walk it because they're not in a rush to leave. The announcement by Hassan Rouhani comes as Iran faces crushing U.S. sanctions after the country pulled out of its nuclear deal with the world powers last year. Mr. Rouhani made the announcement in a speech in the desert city of Yazid, he said, the field was located in Iran's southern Kurdistan province, home to its crucial oil industry. He added that 50 billion barrels would be added to Iran's proven reserves of some 150 billion. The screws on Iranian crude output appear to be tightening, but will that impact the flow of supply for global oil markets? The answer might lie in OPEC. When announcing the end of waivers, the White House said it was working closely with top oil exporters, Saudi Arabia and here in the UAE, to ensure the market is adequately supplied. That raises the question of what extra capacity OPEC producers have. It depends on how much Iran's exports are diminished. But let's say at the high end, Iran's exports might be reduced by 700,000 up to 1 million barrels per day. Um, so then we've got the countries that would really step in are, would be Saudi Arabia, of course, which has something on the range of 2 million barrels a day spare capacity, the UAE perhaps 300,000, Iraq perhaps another 300,000. So there's, in principle there's ample spare capacity to make up for any loss from Iran. However, of course, Iran is not the only thing going on in the oil market. You know, Venezuela's collapse is continuing, which threatens 600,000 or so barrels per day. There's fighting in Libya, that's a million barrels per day at risk. So if all these things were to come together, then the market would be much tighter. Last week, oil prices dipped as US President Donald Trump again pressured OPEC to raise production. But some analysts say the eventual ending of US waivers on Iranian oil has already been factored into markets. We believe this has largely priced in the removal of the waiver of our Iranian crude. If you look at the oil production coming out of Iran, it has fallen more than 1 million barrels. The same for its export numbers. And because of that, the, the oil price have also been moving to new high, recently touching $74 before the tweet came out from Trump. So the price have moved quite a lot. We believe it's largely, largely priced in. What Riyadh does next could be key. As it stands, an OPEC-led supply cut agreed with Russia is still in effect. And on Tuesday, Saudi Arabia said the deal could be extended beyond June to incorporate the rest of 2019. That's likely sent oil prices up, and all they've surged almost 40% since January. Despite US pressure, it's not yet clear whether OPEC is a willing partner of the White House. Jacob Greaves, CTN in Dubai. 
The new oil field could become Iran's second largest field after one containing 65 billion barrels in Ahvaz. I'm telling the White House that in the days when you sanctioned the sale of the Iranian oil, the country's workers and engineers were able to discover 53 billion barrels of oil, Mr. Rouhani said. And Iran has just announced that it has discovered a new oil field with the capacity to produce nearly 53 billion barrels of crude, which could generate billions of dollars for the crippling economy. RT correspondent Saya Tavinger is following the story. Uh, so Saya, what does this actually mean for Iran? Well, Manila, this newly discovered 53 billion barrels would add, will be added to Iran's already proven reserves of about 150 billion barrels. So it's pretty significant. Now, this news also comes just after Iran announced that they've restarted an underground laboratory, which would allow Tehran to produce even more low enriched uranium. 53 billion barrels means that our crude production will be boosted by 1%, or 530 million barrels, which, with current prices, will bring us nearly 23 billion U.S. dollars in revenue. That 1% is our current oil recovery capacity. Now, in terms of revenue potential, this new oil field in southern Iran could bring billions of dollars into the country, like you said, into their sanctioned shrinking economy. But even though this new oil discovery would add about 34% per, to Iran's total crude oil reserve, it still remains to be seen whether Iran would benefit from the oil as it has struggled to sell any kind of energy commodity in the wake of U.S. sanctions. Like, you know, just last month, Iran announced the discovery of a natural gas reserve that could bring about $40 billion in revenue. So even though both wines come at an ideal time for Iran, it doesn't necessarily mean that Iran can export any of this. And there's also another issue that no one is really talking about. Soon Iran will have to start even reducing even more production if it hasn't already started as their storage capacity is already filling up. So there's all this oil, even, where's all this oil even going to be stored? So Iran does not have that capacity because they're already storing billions of barrels of crude oil that they can't sell at the moment. And that's because in May, the U.S. ended waivers that allowed eight countries to continue purchasing Iranian oil, significantly reducing the country's oil exports and causing in part a sharp economic downturn as we've seen right now is causing the Iranian currency to really plummet in value and with the recent tension in the Persian Gulf plus Iran's recent announcement that they're producing even more low enriched uranium daily I really don't see the sanctions being removed anytime soon so again great potential with no real benefits or immediate benefits I should say in Washington Sai Tavinger RT Hey YouTube, thanks for checking out our channel. We hope you enjoyed the video. We have tons of content for you just like this. For more of RT America's one-of-a-kind news and analysis, be sure to subscribe and never stop questioning more. Iran currently has the world's fourth largest proven deposits of crude oil and the world's second largest deposits of natural gas. Since the US controls the majority of the oil fields and natural resources in the Middle Eastern countries through occupation and military presence surrounding the oil-rich states. With this new discovery of oil reserves and gas pipelines, the US has grown impatient and wants to initiate an illegal war with Iran to secure control in the name of national interest and security. Away their wealth. I would take away the oil. But wouldn't you be destroying the wealth of Iraq? No, no, let me tell you. There is no Iraq. There is no Iraq. Their the leaders Iraqis are corrupt. Differ with Excuse you. me, there are no Iraqis. They're broken up into so many different factions. Didn't you need U.S. troops to protect the oil company? You, yes, you put a ring around them. You put a ring. You have just taken all of the wealth away. This is what should be done. How are we going to take the oil? How are we going to do that? You, just, you would leave a certain group behind and you would take various sections where they have the oil. They have, I, people don't know this about Iraq, but they have among the largest oil reserves in the world, in the entire world. So you would keep troops in Iraq after this year? I would take the oil. I don't understand how you would take the Does that mean keeping troops there or, or staying in, involved in Iraq? You heard me. I would take the oil. Oh. Well, what do you do about you it? You stay and protect the oil and you uh. take the oil. And we pay ourselves back a trillion and a half dollars or more. We take care of Britain. You take care of other countries that helped us. And we don't be so stupid. One more point on this. I have long said that we should have kept the oil in Iraq.
the basic idea here seems to be that America should be free to fight wars in the toughest manner possible to defeat its enemies, destroy whatever property and inflict collateral damage as they please. To defeat violent people, the deductive logic goes, we need to be more violent than they are. In addition, we are not allowed to touch or speak out against the Western regime's violence and chaotic behavior out of legitimate fear of being incorrectly labeled as a terrorist. Since the United States withdrew from the 2015 nuclear deal, the other countries involved, Britain, Germany, France, Russia and China have been struggling to save it. They have offered no means by which Iran can sell its oil abroad. The collapse of the nuclear deal coincided with a tense summer of mysterious attacks on oil tankers and Saudi oil facilities that the US blamed on Iran. Tehran denied the allegations though it did seize oil tankers and shoot down a US military surveillance drone. All this was designed to stage a probable means to go to war with Iran. How Russia could be dragged into this conflict. Tens of thousands of Russian troops and aircraft are based in Syria in support of Bashar al-Assad's regime. They include special forces and the feared S-400 anti-aircraft missiles, the most advanced military system in the world. And if the conflict escalates, Russia could feel compelled to defend its ally or Iran to retaliate if its troops are killed as collateral damage by the US. It could also use strategic assets based in Russia, such long-range missiles and long-range bombers along with ships and submarines based in the Mediterranean at Sevastopol. How Israel could retaliate. If Israel is attacked by Iran, it is sure to retaliate. It has nuclear weapons and an array of advanced fighter jets capable of launching strikes at Iran and Iranian forces in Syria as it has done in the past. Its special forces are also among the most feared in the world and stationed across the region. The nuclear program and the strait, however, aren't the only two reasons behind the troubled relationship. Israel ha is the third player in the triangle. In the event of an attack by the USA, the Iranians have time and again threatened to lay waste to the illegal occupied territory of Israel due to the illegal occupation of Palestinian lands. Iran continues to criticize the Israelis and has seriously threatened to attack and destroy it many times in the past. One of the predictions behind the recent escalation is also a preemptive strike against the Iranians so as to avoid a disastrous attack on Israel, though this seems to be a far-fetched conspiracy theory. By isolating the Iranians, the United States of America has already silenced all channels of communication which could have been used to broker peace between the two countries. The sanction-ridden country has already faced the brunt of the most part of the world and seemingly has nothing to lose. It would be suicidal but for the Iranians it would serve a purpose. They consider it a spiritual duty to fight the Americans and the Israelis. The USA is a considered the mother of all evil in their eyes. Hatred for the USA is what a newborn child carries for the, from the womb. It would indeed be difficult to fight off such a charged up nation willing to spill its blood if that means the destruction of either Israel or the USA or preferably both. It is imperative that the escalating tensions between the two countries should be eliminated at the earliest. Not only a potential conflict would be disastrous for Iran, it would be catastrophic for the entire region. Thousands of innocent people who have nothing to do with the corridors of power would suffer. Unfortunately, Pakistan being a neighboring country to Iran has always relied upon external factors whilst making decisions of its own to please our Western friends and the Saudi brothers. Pakistan has pushed Iran away and created a no-go area in between, notwithstanding the fact that we share a border with Iran. We have managed to create an uneasy relationship with them. The lack of trust is evident. At the moment, what Pakistan needs to realize is the threat it faces in the light of an ensuing conflict in the region 
With Iran out of the way, all the guns would turn towards Pakistan. A conflict of this scale would contribute to lives lost, economic activity suspended and may even potentially be the trigger of a much greater war. Maybe the conflict lifts the curtain on the final war, the war which has the potential to bring about an end of the world as we know it. Considering all the contributing factors, Pakistan without choosing a side should actively advocate restraint and play a more significant role in bringing both parties to the table. It would be in the best interest of Pakistan to diffuse the tensions. A potential conflict on the other hand would risk the very stability and we ourselves have sought after for the past so many years. The explosions of the in the Persian Gulf would vibrate through the foundations of our country and would have the prospects of having a trickle-down effect. Now, now I'm not perfect, I like to say. I'm just the best on radio, and, and you weren't so happy with me last time, so I want to go back to foreign affairs now, but with fair warning. No, no gotchas, no tricks. Okay. Pakistan is the most dangerous country in the world long-term, other than Iran, because it's got 90 or more nuclear weapons, and they got the Taliban. If it goes unstable, and you're the president, Donald Trump, what are you going to do? Well, number one, it is probably the most dangerous because of the fact it has the nukes. And, you know, you might add North Korea to that group because there you have a total madman. At least in Pakistan, you have some semblance of sanity at this moment. But it could go rogue, and something like that could happen. And I think you have to get, and it's involved right now anyway, but you have to get India involved. India's the check to Pakistan. And you have to get India involved. They have their own nukes. They have a very powerful army. They seem to be the real checkmate. They seem to be the real, the real group. And I, I would start talking at that level very, very quickly. But look, you cannot have a rogue group with nukes. You can't have it. We've got it already. You know, one of the things I brought up at the debate, I got no credit for it, and now everybody's talking about it is North Korea. I said, wait a minute, folks, we're talking now. During the debate, and you remember, I think you remember yes, when I, I do. mentioned it. I yes, said, I we're do. talking so much about Iran, and they don't have nukes at this moment. They may have them fairly quickly based on this ridiculous deal that was made, but they don't have nukes. You have a madman over in North Korea who actually has nukes, and he says he's going to use them every two weeks. He pops up and says he's going to use them. Nobody ever talks about it. So since I said that, I've noticed that Rubio and others have been talking more about North Korea. You have a lot of hot spots, but Pakistan is a serious problem. They have weapons that work, and they have a lot of them. And I think we have to deal very closely with India having to do with no, that. that I, I agree with that. Would you be prepared to send American troops, as President Obama did, to get Osama bin Laden to go and get their nukes if it became an unstable? Well, let, let me you tell you, it's so important to me. If I won, I, I don't want to be talking to you, you, it, and all of these people about what I want to do. You have to have a certain, uh, you know, people can't know exactly what your intentions are. And I tell people the process that we have is so ridiculous. Give your exact, what are you going to do against ISIS? What are you going to do against this? Well, what do you, you want to have a certain amount of, uh, you, you want to have a little bit of guesswork for the enemy. And I just don't want to be telling people, and, and this is, by the way, this has nothing to do with lack of knowledge, because I think I know as much about Pakistan as most other people. But I will tell you, I don't want to broadcast my intentions. I don't want to have, I'm so transparent, I'm so open, here's what we're going to do. They have to guess. They have to be able to say, you know, he's unpredictable. One of the articles came out recently about my business dealings. And a very respected man said that Trump is one of the greatest business in the wor businessmen in the world because he's totally unpredictable. We never know what he's going to do. And you know what? I want to be unpredictable with this, too. I don't want to be like Obama where he's always saying, you know, we're going to go in two weeks, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do that. And I'm saying to myself, can you imagine General Douglas MacArthur or General Patton? They're spinning in their graves. So when you talk about Pakistan, and let's say they go rogue, I don't want to really be saying what my initial thought is. Also, my initial thought may be much different from what I want to do at the time. But I want them to not know what my thought process is. Does that make any sense to you? It makes, it makes perfect. It's Nixonian, actually. And I, I said that the last time, even in the interview, that people thought you'd uh, stumbled around. And I said, actually, gave a very Nixonian answer on China. You just did again. Last question. You did not get to answer the global warming question. We ran out of time. And again, 11 people on the stage. You got the most time, but it was still not enough time for everyone. Do you believe that the temperature of the Earth is increasing? And what would you do if you do believe that vis-a-vis -vis global uh, climate change?